I'm going to show you step by step how to write a proposal to win your next government contract. So if you're just starting out, you just formed your business or you've been in business for about one to three years and you're looking for ways to generate more revenues for your business, government is the best way to go. So by the end of this video, you're gonna fully understand what a solicitation is, how to respond to a solicitation by creating a proposal so that way you can win your next government contract. So let's jump on a computer so I can show you an actual bid that we won from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, all right? So let's jump straight to it. So here we have the Federal Bureau of Prisons. This is from the US Department of Federal Bureau of Prisons. This is actually MDC out in Brooklyn where they had a fire alarm contract where they had some troubles on the system. They put out a solicitation looking for minority owned vendors, rather minority owned fire alarm companies to service their fire alarm system. So we're gonna go through this entire solicitation and I'm gonna show you how I wrote the proposal against the solicitation so that way we can answer all the questions that they're asking and show them that we know exactly what we're talking about and we're the ones for this job and to give us this job. If you stay around to the end of the video, I'll show you where you can get a copy of this proposal and a copy of other documents that'll help you, you know, put source of sort notices together to actually send out your source of sort notice to actually put together a company capability statement and to also have your proposal like a template. All these three items are templates that you can customize to your business so that way you can have at least a starting place, all right? So let's get straight into this and let me show you what I'm talking about. Everything on a solicitation is important. So the statement of work, you wanna know what the project number is, what the project you're actually looking for. To actually get this, let me backtrack a little bit. If you have a business, that means you, you know, register with the state, you have a tax ID, you have a business bank account, you have a DUNS number, you are also registered on SAM. I'm assuming that you're registered with SAM. If you're not registered with SAM, that is the only way for you to be able to bid on government contracts. So once you get registered with SAM, you will then get a cage code and a unique identifier. So these two items you need before you can start bidding on government contracts. If you wanna know how to register with SAM, you already know what to do. Yeah, this is for MDC Brooklyn. So you wanna go through this document and see exactly what they're talking about. So the summary of work you wanna go through, this is pretty much telling you who they are, where they're located, and the general project requirements that they're looking for in order to solve the problem that they're looking to solve, right? So here, let me just read a little bit of this. It says the contractor must comply and conform to all applicable federal, state, local, and agency codes, regulations, and policies related to the trade work under the scope of work. SOW is scope of work. It is the contractor's responsibility to apply for all and acquire all applicable permits required to perform the work, collect and turn over any manifest to the COR. The COR is the contracting officer representative, okay? And you dispose of hazardous regulated materials requiring such. The contractor shall also report to the COR at any equipment deemed salvageable and recyclable along with the value. So when you're reading this, you're actually trying to put prices to all of these different type of variables that they're asking you to put pricing on. So if you have to dispose of equipment, that takes time. So put time against you taking the equipment out of the, of the building and disposing it correctly or disposing it somewhere at their location. All that takes time. So it's telling you exactly what you need to do. So all of these things, you got to start thinking about how you're going to price your hourly rate and how you're going to price these particular items that they're looking to get priced. So when you scroll further down, this is going to tell you all of the work that needs to be done. So when it comes to fire alarm, what they did was isolated all these troubles here. These are all individual troubles on the fire alarm system. So what I do is I'm looking at each one. They said this one is the West Building first floor smoke detector in the lobby is labeled as second floor needs to be programmed in the correct area loop. Meaning that there's a, a smoke detector that's on the first floor and I have to go inside, use programming and change the label from first floor to second floor. How much is that gonna cost? Right, so each one of these line items have a price associated to it. And when I open up the proposal, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Before I get into that, 
This is only a 14 page document. Some solicitations come in about five, 300 to 1000 pages and you have to know what sections you need to read in order to look through it. In another video, I'll go through a solicitation that has more pages to show you what you can pull out and we'll use chat GBT to simplify it for you. So once I read all these individual troubles, I determine, oh, these are easy, I can fix this. So depending on what your business is, you will know if you can do it or not. Even if you don't know how to perform the work that the government is looking for, you could find subcontractors that do that particular work. You just gotta learn how to build relationships. So they're telling you here, the contractor use of the premise, meaning what are the regulations for you moving around this building? So this is a federal prison. So you know you can't bring in no contraband. You have to fill out a form and write down all the individual tools, screwdrivers, Phillips, flathead, you know, if you have a meter, if you have drills, you have the drill bits, everything needs to be listed out on a piece of paper so that way it can be verified by the correction officer and then it can let you into the building. So there's no parking. Uh, you can park in front of the building if there's parking, but usually that's all taken up by the COs. And if this was like, let's say a construction project where we're doing an install, they will give us a temporary office so that way we can operate every day on a daily basis inside of the facility. Also give you more details of what you should be doing on this particular contract. And even after you fix it, what you need to do after you fix it, the paperwork you have to submit. If there's anything that's outside of the scope, you need to bring that to their attention so that way they can maybe adjust the contract and give you some more money or take away money, whatever the situation is. Letting you know the execution of work and the clarification of information. It says the construction document intends to provide a complete project. The contractor shall be responsible for this result. The contractor shall verify all measurements and accountable for their correctness. The contractor shall lay out the work and responsible for all lines, elevations, and measurements of the builders, utilities, and other work executed by them. This includes verification of existing conditions if that affect their work to which their work can be fitted. One incident I had on this project was a ground fault. And if you know anything about fire alarms, ground fault is usually infamous on these types of systems. And not everybody can deal with them or fix them or find them. One of the issues that they have that's given this system a ground fault is the wiring. According to the manufacturer specs, the wiring is not rated. So they're using, number one, the, the wrong type of wiring. And number two, they have a mix of wiring, meaning they have one type of wiring throughout the building and then I guess they made some additions and now they have a secondary type of cabling. So two different types of cabling, three different types of cabling, four different types of cabling can cause these fluctuations when it comes to ground fault and the manufacturer do not support that. So I had to write a letter against that. It was hard for me to take pictures because you can't go in there with a cell phone. You have to put everything inside your locker. So I had to take detailed notes and create a letter, which I'll show you the letter, how I created the letters against these issues that I've seen to try to protect me so that way I can get paid on the contract. So here they got some definitions to let you know what all these acronyms stand for. Now they are asking for project meetings. This was a fairly quick project for me. It's only 32 troubles. It took me a couple weeks just to fix the troubles, even with all the slow movement around in the building. It only took me a few weeks, but let's say if we was doing an install and we had to install this system, this is a large building, two buildings, I think nine floors on one building, 13 floors on another. So this could potentially be a two, three year type of project if we were doing a full install. So at that point, we will have project meetings. We coordinated probably every 30 days or something like that. They outline the schedule, so they want you to do that. They will have a pre-construction meeting where you will let them know or pretty much lay out the whole entire job. You will have a progress meeting, what's going on during the job, how much progress did you finish this far from the time you started. And then they have also what they call submittals. Submittals is saying we propose a new system. They would like the specs on the system, the main control panel, the smoke detectors, the pull stations, the duct detectors, the horns, whatever you're using, they want the specifications for each one of these particular items so that way they can verify that it's what they're looking for, more or less. So the contract management requirements, also, yeah, I'll show you what the schedule of values are. So you have to do a construction schedule, schedule of values, pay application and contract modifications. If, if any one of those things, you would have to present that ahead of time. Like if you catch a bump in the road, you gotta let them know right away. And here, they're telling you what the schedule of value should include. 
a schedule of value is a breakdown of the progress of the job. So let's say, like I said, if this is an install, and let's say in the beginning of the job is always initial deposit. Like I'm trying to always get some money up front to let them know this is gonna be for the design, the engineer to come out to measure the building. If we don't have contractual drawings, the engineer will come out and you know take a survey and do his design when he go back after the survey buy the equipment, whatever equipment we need to buy, payroll, all of that stuff, we try to get in the initial deposit so we can just fund the job. From that point, you just let them know each phase of the job. You're gonna be doing the rough end, you're gonna be running the wire, we're gonna be putting the uh, devices, and then we're gonna be programming. So you're breaking down the phases of the job, and in addition to breaking down the phases, you're allocating how much money you want per phase, and I'll show you what that looked like in the schedule of value. Construction facilities and controls, like if this was a project, we'll be having to worry about that. Safety and health, because this is more or less a service, an extended service call, more than an install and whatnot. So we didn't have to pull any permits. We didn't have to do anything like that. This is just generally a regular service call. Hey, come fix a couple smokes, ground fault, things like that. So we don't have to pull out any heavy tools or any heavy drill or anything like that. So the construction cleaning, none of that applied to me because I'm not doing any type of construction work. So now the closeout is very important. When you finish the job, you have to pay attention to this part and write each note and answer each one of these questions in order for you to get payment. So the completion is when a contractor considers the work is substantially complete, submit the following to the contracting officer, a written notice that the work or designated portion thereof is substantially complete and written and inspected by the contracting officer representing and, and the contracting officer. A punch list of remaining incomplete non-compliant items shall accompany this written notice. And I'll show you also the report that we wrote. Within a reasonable time of receipt of such notice, the contracting officer and contracting officer representative shall inspect to determine the status of substantial completion. So they have to check the work and verify that what I said was completely true. The contracting officer determines that the work is not substantially complete, then they will offer the contract in writing what the reasons were. Now the contractor will have to go back and make some remedies and fix whatever these issues that they said were not complete. So all of these items have to be completed in order for you to get paid. But once you go through all of that, when all work is acceptable, the contracting officer will issue a certificate of contract completion or the other approved form of contractor for signature. Final application for payment. After the contractor officer fully accepts the work, the contractor shall submit the final application for payment in accordance with the procedures and requirements stated in the contract. As required by the contracting officer, the final application for payment shall include affidavits that all bills have been paid. The contractor's submission of the final application for payment shall signify that the work is complete and that the contractor has vacated the project work site. So that is what you would have to do to get paid. This is very involved. And you know, you're just protecting yourself and they're protecting themselves. So now let me show you what the proposal looked like. This is our final proposal, right? So yeah, of course, you know, it's addressed to them, the date we submitted it. This is just like what my proposal looked like. This is like the cover letter. I'm addressing the contracting officer, what the project's scope is, a little message that, you know, we understand what's going on inside of the scope of work. And you know, we are the ones to do this job. Here's a company overview explaining who we are, area of expertise, some information. When I was talking about the cage code and Dunn's number, this is what I mean here. The cage code, and then you get a unique identifier that I don't have on here, but you get a cage code, you have a Dunn's number, you have your tax ID, and you have your NAICS code. My NAICS code, this is pretty much the classification, like the type of work I do. So 561621 says that I do fire alarm and security work, access control, I can sell the equipment and things like that. And a 281, 210 is letting them know that I can run wires, data cables and stuff like that. Here's our past performance, giving them a little history of the work we did in the background. Some of the logos of the companies we work for. Here's more or less more information of the, the companies that we work for and the dollar value of the project size. I'm giving them information about who our team is, our staff. And here in the general requirements, this is where I start to do this part. For them to fully understand that you understand what you understand, more or less, you have to copy and paste what they're asking for. So I copied this whole scope of work and then I pasted it here. This is telling them that 
I'm repeating, literally repeating back what they said. So in a in larger solicitation, you will be copy and paste in certain sections to let them know you understand what this solicitation is asking for. So I'm letting them pretty much know I'm understanding what they're asking for, all of these 32 items. And I'm letting them know what's not covered under this scope of work. So just in case I do have to make some drilling, I'm not trying to clean up or anything like that. And if there's a fire, flood, or any type of natural disaster because of whatever, you know, inmates fighting each other, it's not because of me. I don't want to be held responsibly for time or not finishing because of something I couldn't control. Now, the personnel, I'm just letting them know we're licensed. We have NYSED certified techs because you at least have to be NYSED level two to work on the service fire alarm systems. The working conditions, you get these hours from the solicitation, the time that they work. So you want to try to work in a time frame that they work in. I'm letting them know the numbers that, you know, our 24 hour number, if they need any type of emergency service, how are we going to deliver the equipment or material or service product, whatever we're delivering. The place of performance with that usually they give you an address where you actually physically have to do the work. And the period of performance is 30 days after the notice is received, meaning that once they say you get the go ahead, I have 30 days to start the job. So here is where I break down each one of those items one by one and then allocate a price next to it. There's some figuring out you have to do, how much labor material and everything you have to use, programming, stuff like that. And then you get your final price. Once you get your final price, second to last sheet is my more or less my signature page letting them know where can I send the invoices, how are you going to be paid, and if you understand exactly what's inside of this RFP or my proposal. At the end, I just let them know who it was generated for. So like I said, the schedule of value. So this breaks down pretty much the project progress. So line item one, we're going to do these line items. We're going to fix whatever these line items are, 1, 14, 16, 19, 20, 21, 26, 29. These probably were something very easy I could fix real quick changing out batteries, replacing a device and things like that. So it's gonna be this much for that. So say like I got paid 25,000 on this one. So now what the schedule of value will do is mark down, you got paid $25,000, you're 93% complete for this particular item. To finish this item is $1,800 left. There's a $2,500 retainage fee because when you're doing projects, every time you build, you gotta hold back 10%. So that way at the end of the project, you only owe 10%, you made 90 and you're good to go. So it also reduces the total value just to keep track of where the money is going, how much you spent on equipment, how much is completed. So this is what the schedule of values is for, especially in contracting. When you have projects, this is the perfect way for you to manage your projects and even budget your projects. When you get a notice to proceed, this is what a notice to proceed would look like. It'll come in a document looking like this, sort of like their solicitation, but this is what a notice to proceed would look like. And they will have their signature here. They will have the PO or, you know, how you could, when you bill, how you could actually get this money. They'll give you the scope, what is actually the scope of work is and what you're doing. And then the dollar value that you got awarded the contract for. So when you get a notice to proceed, you will then put your signature, your name and title, and you will date it and then you will send it back to the contracting officer, this guy right here, or whomever that person is for that particular job, and you got the job from there. So now I hope you understand and got a grasp or a better idea of how you can write your proposal for your type business, and you could also download those documents. Like I said, I put a link in the description so you could get those documents. I keep them in a Word document so that way it's editable and you could change it up, take out my logo, take out my information, and put your information in there so that way you could have a template and move faster when you're sending out quotes. So if you have any questions, you already know. Peace.